Today in Reishak, we talk about operating outside of the United States if you are a U.S. citizen. And we also talk about operating in the United States if you're visiting and from another country. We also talk about the different types of permits you'll need and how exactly you obtain them. And finally, I'll let you know why I became a United States citizen. All coming up. So somebody once told me, I love all of America, North and South and Central and the Caribbean too, I would add. So really America, you know, the continents of America, you have North America, you have South America, you have Central America. They came together and they signed a treaty and developed something called the International Amateur Radio Permit. Now, this isn't all countries within this particular hemisphere. But it's a good number of them. And if you're going to Argentina, Brazil, Canada, El Salvador, Panama, Peru, Trinidad and Tobago, the United States, if you're from one of those other countries, Uruguay or Venezuela, you will be fine to operate with the International Amateur Radio Permit, which is this thing. Now, before we talk about the IARP, If you are a United States citizen going to Canada, you do not need anything special to go to Canada. All you need is your United States amateur radio license, and you need to be mindful of where you're operating from, specifically which province and call sign prefix. For example, if I were to operate in Ontario, if I were to go and visit my friends in Toronto, I would be N2RJ. And then you put the prefix at the end, the Canadian prefix at the end, and to RJ stroke Victor Echo 3. If a Canadian friend of mine, let's say Mike VA3MW, decided to come down to New Jersey, he would be VA3MW stroke W2. And of course, it's important to know that if you were to go to his um, company, the Flex Radio Company in Texas, he would be VA3MW stroke W5. It does go by call districts. It's also important to note that if you operate outside of the of the contiguous United States, for example, in Puerto Rico or Hawaii or Alaska, you do not need to use their prefixes, but some contest organizers expect you to as part of their contest rules, but there is no FCC rule regarding that. And that is that. Things to keep in mind, the band plans do allow you to operate phone on 7.075 to 7.1 megahertz in certain regions outside of the contiguous United States. And that is about really um, the only difference. Otherwise, the same privileges apply across the board. Of course, with minor little variations here and there where we have to protect neighboring countries and also U.S. military installations. So while we're talking about military installations, there is kind of one exception that is a military base. That is Guantanamo Bay. So, um, I mean, I probably talked to a very small minority of people, but if you're going to Guantanamo Bay, as a military member, not a prisoner, you would um, you would be able to operate there and get a call sign there with the prefix KG4. Uh, the thing is, though, that that's not really in the in the FCC database for some reason. But you will be able to operate there. Being simply being on a military base overseas does not give you the right to operate amateur radio there. With your United States call sign. All right, so that is that. Let's talk about the IARP for a minute. So this document here, at least the one I have here in the United States, is the amateur, International Amateur Radio Permit. And in the United States, it is issued by the ARL. In some countries, it's issued by their government. In some countries, it's issued by their telecommunication authority. 
here in the United States, they let the volunteer examiners do it. And the ARRL does it. And here you can see this picture that I took at Costco. <laughs> um, pretty interesting. So I got this for a trip to Argentina. And um, it was quite interesting. So like I said, if you're going to Argentina, Brazil, Canada, El Salvador, Panama, Peru, Trinidad and Tobago, um, United States of America, of course, Uruguay and Venezuela, you use the IERP. And they have some important notices. So you must sign the permit, of course. You must have a copy of your valid amateur radio license. You cannot use an expired amateur radio license. And it must accompany the IARP at all times. Of course, the governmental authorities are not going to be looking over your neck, making sure that you have this license with you. But it's a good idea to know where both are. And it's probably a good idea to keep them together. Keep with your passport. Unless otherwise requested by regulations of the country visited, station identification shall be prefix of the visited country or region thereof, the word stroke or slash, followed by the call sign of the license. So if I were to visit somewhere in Argentina, I would be Lima United stroke N2RJ. If I were to visit somewhere in Venezuela, don't know what I'd be going there right now. I would be Yankee Victor, Stroke, and 2RJ. Of course, that's standard practice. It's important to note that these are valid for one year. So you get these for one year. I think it costs like $10 and you're valid for one year. You get it when you go to travel. You know, you might be able to get away with going in a foreign country and operating and not getting the special permission, but why risk it? I mean, you know, they're not like the United States. Some of them might just not give you the time of day and just throw you in jail. Some of them might be quite cool about it, to be honest. You know, some of them might be more relaxed about it. But I generally, the rule I have when visiting any foreign country is make sure you obey all their laws, especially, and I know this in Trinidad and Tobago, a lot of radio operators are treated with great suspicion because radios have been used for um, organizing terrorism and all sorts of stuff. I'm not saying that's a valid reason. I'm saying that's their rationale. We had our own incidences with terrorism back in the 1990s. And that's how our regulations got a lot stricter. Um, the IERP is valid for one year um, or expiration of your license, whichever is first. A visited country may decline to honor, suspend, or cancel the operation of an IERP. So if they don't want to honor it, then it's not valid. Some countries might require you to notify them in advance. It might be as simple as emailing either their local telecommunications authority or the local radio club. And this is an important notice. Whenever you're traveling anywhere and you want to operate, your first stop, your first, first, first stop should always be the local radio clubs because they might know some things that generally you would not find in official sources. They might know perhaps the most common one is they might know the name of somebody at the telecommunications licensing authority who might be a radio amateur, might be a member of their club, or, you know, they might just be on good terms with this person. So they might get things smoother for you so that especially when you're arriving at the airport, and you're bringing in amateur radio equipment that you don't hit any surprises with the equipment being seized or worse. You know, some countries, like I said, you know, a lot of countries are pretty good about it, but it's best not to have any surprises. I know in Trinidad and Tobago, they might actually seize the equipment and, and make you pay a bond before you get it in. And sometimes you might not get the bond back. That's just how it goes. A lot of tourists have had stories like that. Me as a citizen, they'll tell me just pay customs duty on it. So that is the IARP. Let's talk about the privileges you get. For US amateurs, there are two classes of IARPs. Class one requires a knowledge of the international Morse code and carries all operating privileges. Technician, general, 
advanced or extra class U.S. licenses proficient in Morse code qualify for class one. And this is interesting. It's kind of vague. They say CITEL, C-I-T-E-L, that's the, the, um, the Conference of International um, Inter-American Telecommunications has not issued direct directives on what is required to prove competence. Be prepared if asked to demonstrate Morse code proficiency. For foreign amateurs, class one is equivalent to our current amateur extra class. Class two does not require knowledge of telegraphy and carries all operating privileges above 30 megahertz. U.S. licensees not proficient in Morse code qualify for class two. There is no equivalent class description for the U.S. novice license. Therefore, the U.S. novice license is not eligible for like the 15 people that have a novice license. There's more. I'm just joking. The permit describes its authority in four different languages. And of course, those languages would be Spanish, Portuguese, English, and French. So that is the privileges. Now, a little thing about Morse code. And I'll explain what, what I my thing about it is. When I obtained my licenses in Trinidad and Tobago and also in the United States, I proved my proficiency in Morse code. I did that by passing a code exam. That is not possible today, obviously, because Morse code as a, as a testing requirement has long been abolished since 2007. And, you know, it's a good thing. I think generally that, you know, Morse code is a very nice mode to operate, but I think it was time to move on. Um, if you know Morse code, this really, all this really says is that you must have knowledge of Morse code. So if you know Morse code on your own, and I think a good way to prove it is if you can get one of those AWRL certificates that, you know, with the qualifying runs and you keep that with you, that can at least demonstrate to the authorities if they ever question you. And you would be able to operate HF and VHF and, you know, UHF and everything. Of course, if you don't have any proficiency in Morse code, you're limited to 30 megs and above. In practice, it might be different. It's always up to discretion of their agency, their local telecommunications authority. So this is the permit. It's pretty cool. Um, it's important to note that if you are in the United States, if you have a U.S. license and you want to operate abroad, you must be a United States citizen. Um, not a permanent resident with a green card, unfortunately, not H-1B, not a student visa. You must be a United States citizen. So that's it with the IARP. And um, next we're going to talk about the CEPT and traveling to Europe. So you're going to travel to Europe. The pandemic restrictions have been lifted. Hopefully they will be soon. And you board a plane and you end up in Europe, maybe France or Germany or even the United Kingdom, which kind of is still part of Europe. And you want to play radio. So what do you need? Well, you need, of course, your United States amateur radio license. You need a copy of your passport because the recipro reciprocity only applies to United States citizens. And you would need a copy of the FCC public notice, which details the CEPT operating agreement. So you're operating under something called CEPT um, reciprocal operation. CEPT stands for the Conference of um, European Posts and Telecommunications or something like that. So they're an authority. They're kind of like a... a um, uh, umbrella organization of the different um, posts and telecommunications authorities within Europe, including the United Kingdom. And they have this recommendation. It used to be TR-6101, a technical recommendation that gave um, foreign radio amateurs within Europe, of course, the ability to just go within these different countries and operate. Usually it's mostly the European Union and um, 
pretty much that and United Kingdom, which was part of the European Union. So um, the United States recognizes this agreement as well. And as such, the Europe also recognizes us. So we can use our licenses and operate there. There is a catch. You must be at least a general license holder. You cannot operate with a technician and or a novice license because quite simply there is no reciprocity for what they call a foundation license. And the foundation license is equivalent to our technician or novice license. It's an entry level license. The general license, unfortunately, in CEPT countries only gives you privileges above 30 megahertz. So you only get privileges on VHF and above. But you can still get on local repeaters, which are on VHF and above, of course. Remember in Europe and um, the UK and other places, they use different procedures such as the tone burst to activate the repeater. So look that up. So you have your advanced or extra class licenses and you get full privileges on HF, VHF and UHF and above. Um, all well and good. It's for United States citizens only. So and vice versa, European citizens coming to um, to America, they can operate. You operate with the um, the destination country's prefix and your home call sign. For example, if I were to operate in the UK, well, I do have a UK license, so it doesn't count. But if I didn't have it, I would be Mike Stroke N2RJ. Or if I would be in Germany, I'd be Delta Lima Stroke N2RJ. And um, that's how I would operate. And it's quite um, it's quite convenient because you don't really have to worry about anything. Unlike the IERP, there's really no expiration. There's no special permits to get. There is nothing. You just travel and you bring in your radio equipment and you operate. Or you go and you operate at, at one of the club stations or one of your friend's houses. I hope one of my friends in Europe will have me over to operate <laughs> when I visit. Um, that would be so cool. But... Um, yeah, it's it's you know it's really simple. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot more to say about it because it's just so dead simple. You also do have to understand that you need to obey all the local laws and ban plans. Um, I especially you know when I'm operating in a foreign country or when I'm visiting a foreign country, I'm a guest of that country, so I do my best to make sure I obey all their laws and regulations to a T because. I would like their citizens when they come here to do return a favor. And it's just good manners. I mean, even in the United States, I obey all the laws anyway. <laughs> Who wouldn't? So, um, you know, it's 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 generally, generally not a hassle at all. Next, we're going to talk about special cases where you can't get either one of those. And what do you do? So we've covered reciprocal agreements. We've covered the obvious ones. You go into Canada, you don't need anything. You can use the IERP, you can use the CEPT. When I was talking about the IERP, I left out a few important countries. What about Mexico? So Mexico is kind of a dead end because Mexico, they changed their telecommunications authority within the last few years. And for a while, they weren't even issuing licenses to their own citizens. And then now they're just not issuing them to foreigners. And I don't know anything about that. I mean, you know, if you're a U.S., if you're a Mexican citizen or a medic Mexican permanent resident, uh, however hard that is to obtain, you'll probably be able to get a license since you have abode there. If you are a military person living, for example, in Germany, um, there is some special forces, um, special uh, provision for armed forces operating there. I believe also in Japan, where you can operate in Japan. Um, but in other countries, you'll have to apply either for a reciprocal license. And I'll put some resources in the links below in the, in the description about where you can apply for foreign licenses and tips on how to get it approved. Like I said, your first stop should always, always be with the local radio club. They're gonna be your most helpful place. 
There are some places that are simply off limits to amateur radio. Obviously, North Korea DPRK is one of them. People have tried. Lord knows they've tried. I have a friend, um, David uh, K2HTV. He donated medical equipment to the North Korean government. And then they took the donation and said, okay, well, we changed our mind. We don't want you to have an amateur radio license. Another one about a de-expedition by another friend of mine. Um, the story was he made all arrangements with the North Korean government. And then eventually word got out and the North Korean government basically told him, well, no license for you. Well, you know, that's a dead end. Yemen was a dead end for a long while until a few of them, notably, notably uh, Dima, Dima RA9 USU, talked to the right people and got permission. So in some places, amateur radio is really hard to come by. And I really appreciate when people take great lengths to go to these rare places. And they operate ham radio because it allows me to work them in DX. Some places, like even if you're a temp not a temporary visitor, like if you're staying a long time, you might want to apply for a home amateur radio license if you're, you know, if you're living there. A lot of countries, the United States is kind of like an anomaly among a lot of countries in that we allow anyone anywhere to obtain an amateur radio license here as long as they can have a United States mailing address. They don't need to have a physical address. They can have a mailing address and that's it. It could be a PO box. It could be a friend's house. It could be anything. The UK is similar. If you have a qualification that can get you a UK license, sure, you can just, and you have a UK address, same thing. I believe Canada, you don't require citizenship or residence there as long as you have an address. A few countries. But there are some countries which will require you to either be a resident there or a citizen. And um, some of these countries might shock you. Some of these countries in Europe, you know, they, they allow you to guest operate, but they will not allow you to have a license, a permanent license there. And... Um, Probably makes sense for them. I mean, you know, their administrations don't want to handle lots of foreign licenses or maybe amateur radio is, is a privilege that is reserved for the locals or something. I know some countries treat it that way. So, um, you know, consider all that when you're applying for a license. The, the procedures do vary. Usually it involves um, either if you're not taking an exam, a lot of countries will accept your American licenses, proof of qualification, Particularly if it's an extra, particularly if it was obtained at the time that you had to take a Morse code test. But even so, a lot of them really will, you know, will, they'll take the American license and just issue one, one there without any problems. For the UK license, I took my City and Guilds Radio Amateurs exam certificate, which was required for me to obtain a license in Trinidad and Tobago. In Trinidad and Tobago, they will now take US FCC licenses as proof of qualification. However, I don't believe they issue call signs, full call signs to anybody but locals, people who have residence there. If you're a foreigner, you're out of luck. And I believe the same is true for other Caribbean countries such as Jamaica. I think Jamaica has that same policy. Um, although some countries might have where, I know Aruba, they issue the call signs and the licenses um, with a different prefix from the locals. And I believe the same is true for Jamaica. So Jamaica 6Y5 is for locals. And you have like 6 Yankee 1 was for foreigners. And um, same in Barbados. Tom Georgians, W2SC. He operated 8 Papa, 8 Peter 1 Alpha, 8 Papa 1 Alpha, famous contest station. Uh, he couldn't get an 8 Papa 6 because he's not a local. He probably can now because he's, you know, he's just been there so often. And um, John Crivelli is Papa 40 Whiskey. And um, they have the locals, I think, are Papa 49 or something like that. So why did I become a United States citizen? Well, apart from the obvious benefits of being able to vote um, and more importantly, having calling the United States home because I intended to fully live here, when I became a permanent resident, um, 
and the other cool stuff, you know, my kids being born here, they're United States citizens, so why wouldn't I be one? So I applied for naturalization in 2007, and um, I became a United States citizen in December that year. Why would I become a United States citizen, and why would that relate to amateur radio? Well, as you may have guessed, probably from all of this time watching this video, a lot of these reciprocal agreements were applicable for United States citizens, meaning that if I wanted to operate CEPT or IARP and, you know, um, I wanted to go to these other countries, travel and operate as an amateur radio operator, I had to be a U.S. citizen. And there's really no way around it. Um, you know, if you're a non-citizen, it doesn't apply. When I first applied for an amateur radio license, I actually was turned down because I didn't have a social security number. Because when you get here, your social security number, you don't immediately get it. You have to wait a little bit. And I jumped the gun. I took the test. I went to take the test and they told me that I couldn't take it because uh, I didn't have an SSN, which is really not true. They were supposed to let me take it and they just write foreign in the place where you put your taxpayer identification number. But um, yeah, so, um, you know, that's why I became a citizen. Renewing my license in Trinidad and Tobago meant I had to go there and do it. And they want you to renew it once per year. It's not like the U.S. where you can renew online. And so only every 10 years or like some other countries that have lifetime licenses. And you just verify your address and verify that you're alive every five years or so. No, you have to go. You have to go in person. You have to go pay money. Um... And now I think it's a hundred TT dollars a year and you have to basically, you know, do the dance. And I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I let that license expire. I just couldn't um, deal with it anymore. But um, yeah, so that's uh, it. And um, we'll see you next time on Ria Shack. Please be sure to like and subscribe and um, tell your friends. You know, we're making a lot of good videos here. And uh, we'll see you around. 73, keep on hamming. N2RJ, see ya.